The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today, we got a very fun lesson. We're going to be talking about self-exaltation. Self-exaltation. And what you, you might say, well, Cody, what does that mean? It means pride in the simplest of terms. We're going we're gonna to be talking about pride today. Now, we have talked about pride before. And I, and I want to say this. The root of all pride and the root of all strife is not only just pride, but it's it's self-centeredness. And that, that's what we're not going to talk about today specifically. Now, we have a teaching on that, dealing with pride and self-centeredness. And I believe truly in my heart that Andrew Womack has the best teaching on overcoming strife because of uh, self-centeredness. I, I believe he's got the best teaching on it. We I use the exact same outline that he teaches from. So, I, I mean, I... The verses he uses are the same verses we use. So I give I give honor where honor is due. That man has a great teaching on it. So if you want to know more about self-centeredness or the root of pride and how strife comes into your life, then I, I encourage you to watch our teaching on that. But we're going to talk about self-exaltation in a way today that is very different than most of the times we've taught it. I want to talk about it specifically in the context of the end, end times and willfully being ignorant. This is going to be a, uh, a very fun lesson for me. This is something that has been going on in the body of Christ for a long time now. But this is something that we have experienced over and over, month in, month out, since we moved to Chicago. And sometimes when I tell people that this is what we face, it's almost, it doesn't click. When I say, well, you... There's no way that that's what's going on. But when, then when they see it happen in real time, in real life, then it starts to click that what I've been saying for so long about the way people will contradict truth is actually what's been going on. Now, I'm not going to talk about specific examples today, except for just one. The willful ignorance of not studying biblical end times. And we're going to talk about it as the root of pride. Now, I want to make two disclaimers. So, disclaimer, disclaimer. Just consider a banner on the screen that says disclaimer, which means you need to listen to what I'm about to say. I'm going to say two things. So, first disclaimer is I want you to watch the entire teaching because what I'm about to say is going to come against pride. And if you are somebody that is easily offended or you are somebody that is... Um, very much rooted in pride or you may not even know you have pride in you but if what I say starts to offend you then you need to understand I need to listen until the end I'm gonna make it all better by the time we get to the end of this lesson but this is something that needs to be addressed so I'm gonna propose an argument today more of a thought we'll, we'll, we'll call it a thought exercise I'm going to give you a bunch of questions to think about, and those questions will attack the root of pride. But I really want you to ponder what the Bible says when it comes to this. Now, when I was in college, I got a degree in interdisciplinary studies. I've said it many times. And the majority of my degree is in communications founded in rhetorical theory and argumentation. I am not going to be arguing the end times today. So I want, I want to understand that. We are not about to have a rhetorical debate based on the end times. All I want you to do is evaluate one presumption, one premise. I want you to think about one thing that you believe about the end times before we ever get into it. 
And we're going to talk about just one aspect today. So if I start talking about this, and in your heart, you just broad stroke it, understand that's why we're talking about this today. So just make sure you're paying attention until the very end. Because this is going to be a very systematic teaching that builds on itself piece by piece until the very end. So if you quit five minutes into the teaching, ten minutes into the teaching, you're not going to get the full understanding. So please make sure that you stay with us the entire time. Second, big disclaimer. If you get offended at this teaching, meaning that what I'm about to say offends you the minute I say it, I, I'm going to pull no punches. I will not sugarcoat this part. You are full of the devil. I'm, I, I'm not going to lie about that. I'm not going to pull punches. If you get offended at the message that's about to come forth, then you are full of the devil. The devil is inside of you. And, and I'm not saying you're possessed, you're oppressed by the devil. I'm not saying any of that. But it definitely will show that there are tears sown in your heart by the enemy that causes you to not walk in all of everything that God has ordained for your life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you and expose your heart today. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, splits asunder even to the dividing of spirit and soul. Well, your mind, will, and emotion is your soul. So if your emotions and your mind and your all of that starts to rile up at this teaching, just realize it's the Word of God splitting you open. And that needs to happen today because this message right here is so vital for the generation in which the Lord returns that we need to talk about it. Now that I've given you two disclaimers, I've probably offended 80% of the people that are watching this right now, but I want to just take one second and say something. I want to share my heart and then I'll teach the lesson. When I moved to Chicago, this is the, the honest aspect of it, for seven and a half to eight years of my walk with the Lord, I did not study end times at all. I, I, I took the stance that almost everybody in the church today takes. I was like, okay, it don't make no sense. I maybe read through the book of the Revelation once, twice maybe. I read through the book of Job one time. You, whoo, judgments, Job, right, wipe the sweat off my head and I move on. You know, like, I didn't want to deal with it. I didn't want to deal with it in time, you know, the, the prophets of the Old Testament, because I'd read it and go, that don't make no sense, and just flip back to the New Testament. Or I'd open the book of the Revelation, I'm like, that's wild, and then just close it. Like, don't make no sense, no sense in studying it. And then I would listen to the fathers in the church, and they would teach, and they would say, well, the church will be raptured. You won't ever experience it. It doesn't matter. When you're neighbor to the Lord, power of God, financial breakthrough, healings, miracles, deliverance. And I was like, well, that sounds good. If I don't have to worry about it because I ain't going to be here, well, it doesn't matter anyway. Yeah, you're right. Let's, let's do the power thing. And I'm all about power. So if you've ever been around me any length of time, you but. You will understand we believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, and operating in all nine gifts. I believe in the power of God. If you've ever been in a church where I have ministered, you will understand I believe in the power of God. Deliverance is one of my favorite things to do, and healing and salvation, and I, I love all of it. I love every aspect of power. It's one, of the, it's one of my favorite things to do. But I understand that that is only part of it. You can get somebody born again, delivered, filled with the Holy Ghost, and starting to walk out their life with the Lord. But if you do not teach the full canon of Scripture, it'll never equip the believer all the way. So the stance that the majority of the church took, well, let me say it, let me, let me not say this because I'm going to offend another group of people, but let me say it about myself. Seven and a half to eight years of my walk with the Lord, I didn't study it because it didn't matter. I'm going to win my neighbor to the Lord, operate in the power of God, believe for financial breakthrough, operate in divine health, minister as much as I could on faith. That's what I did. I think that's a powerful role in the body of Christ. I think it's needful. But if you have no understanding of the end times, you are lacking in a huge portion of the Bible. And I, when I finally opened the end time scripture, the book of the Revelation, book of Daniel, book of Hosea, Isaiah, and I started to study the end times, I realized I was missing a huge chunk of what the Lord wanted to speak to me in my own life. And it radically changed. Now, do we believe in healing? Absolutely. Power of God? Absolutely. 
Financial provision, absolutely. The gifts of the Holy Ghost, absolutely. I, we still believe in all of it, still operate in all of that. But there's much more to your walk with the Lord than just those things. Those are great and those are needful, but there's more. So let's talk about the more today. It's not hard to understand, but uh, I know I prefaced this lesson for about 10 minutes because what I'm about to say is very, very strong. So let's pray, and then I want to jump right into it. And I just encourage you, and I pray to God right now in Jesus' name, that you follow the teaching all the way. Watch all 30 minutes today, because what we are going to teach is going to equip you in a way. And I just want to propose a question. The main thing I want to do today is propose a question to you and make you ponder something. So Father, I thank you. Bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion, transforming us by the root of our by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Go with me to Hosea chapter four. Hosea chapter four. Now if you were a part of this ministry last year, you will realize that we studied through all 14 chapters of the book of Hosea last year. So I encourage you to go back and watch our series called Hosea. Because I'm only going to read one verse today. We could read a lot of these verses, but I'm going to only read one verse specifically. Hosea 4.6. It says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Now, there's two main aspects to Hosea 4.6. Now, there's the aspect most of us know. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. What you don't know is killing you. Main premise. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, that's the first half. But the second half is just as important where it says, Because thou hast rejected knowledge. But then the Lord says, that you shall be no priest to me, means stand before the Lord and minister. You forgot the law, I will also forget your children. Now, I think it's only fitting and a little funny at the same time that, you know, chapters, verses, you know, headers were not in the original text. That's something that the translators put in and the, 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 the people who wrote these different uh, versions of the Bible but my Bible says the willful ignorance and idolatry of Israel. Now, that's only funny to me for one reason. There is a lot of end time prophetic understanding through the book of Hosea, which we're not even gonna talk about any of that today. <clears throat> you can go and study that on your own. Go back and watch our series. We will come back to the book of Hosea very soon. But I want you to understand that what you don't know is killing you. You are destroyed for willful ignorance, meaning that you choose not to know. But then also, what you are destroyed by is the things that are presented that you choose to reject. Now, I've said this before, I agree with a lot of other Bible teachers that say this, when you stand before the Lord, you will have no excuse. And the Bible even says that about the Gentiles. I'm going to take it to the extreme of the church. But the Bible says that the Gentiles will have no excuse because your conscience becomes a law bearing witness against you, meanwhile accusing or else excusing you. I'm not going to go there today. You can study that on your own. Romans 2, Romans 3, and Romans 4. But what's so interesting about that thought process specifically is the fact that if the Gentiles, people who have never been presented the gospel will still have no excuse before God because they knew right and wrong. How much will you, as a believer who's been saved and has the Holy Ghost, how much more you, when you stand before God, God will say, it's in the book. I'm trying not to go too heavy on you today because I, uh, I could give this message really a lot more direct than I'm doing it. And I'm trying to I'm trying to pull back a little bit because we already had a really tough lesson earlier this week. But I want you to understand that when you stand before God, you'll have no excuse. 
You won't be able to say, God, well, I didn't know. What happens when these things start to unfold? You can't say before God, God, I didn't know it was going to happen. God, I, I, was, I just did not have any understanding on it. Well, there has been over 2,000 years that it was wrote in the book. I know people that have been saved 30, 40 years, and they never study in time scripture. And, and, and the question I propose to you is, why? I'm actually going to expose the why today. That's the thing I want to talk about. Now, remember I said that I'm going to say some things that's probably going to offend some people as I go through this lesson. So what I want you to do is hold on. If you're sitting down, grab the armrest of your chair. If you are laying down, just grab your covers. And if you're standing up, you might want to sit down because what I'm about to say it's a, pretty, it's a pretty strong word. But as I prayed about this to share this with you today, this is the verse that the Lord gave me. So go to Genesis chapter 11, starting verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinir, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had made brick for stone, and slime had they made they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now that's important. Let me explain what happens. This right here in Genesis 11 is the Tower of Babel. Now if you say, hey, what is, what does the power, Tower of Babel have anything to do with this? Well, the Babylon has its roots in the Tower of Babel. And not just Babylon itself, but specifically when we talk about the harlot. Now there's a lot of people when it comes to the church and the world as a whole, when they study the end times or when they talk about the end times, one of the main things they want to talk about is the new world order. That's, that's the thing everybody wants to talk about. It's the new world order, new world system, whatever they want to call it. What I want you to understand is that when the Bible talks about a new order, a new world order, whatever it's going to be, the Bible calls it the harlot Babylon. Now we'll talk about this this weekend. We're going to do a whole Sunday service on the harlot. But I want you to start calling it what it is. Now there's a lot of times I sit down with believers, strong believers, and I say, hey, what about the harlot Babylon? And there's no understanding in the church about that. I want you to understand that the harlot Babylon, just as a preview to give you some context, the harlot Babylon is the forerunner to the Antichrist kingdom. So what comes before the Antichrist is the harlot. So just take that understanding so you know kind of what we're going with. Well, you say, Cody, why is the Tower of Babel so important in an understanding of self-exaltation? The Tower of Babel was not about stories high. I mean, we're talking about 6,000 years ago, roughly, you know, five, 6,000 years ago at the Tower of Babel. And you're saying at the Tower of Babel, they, that God was worried about the height of the building. No. I mean, they're using brick and mortar, slime. I mean, the, how big could they really build it? I mean, you look at ancient structures like the pyramids in Egypt. They're tall, but they ain't nothing compared to the Sears Tower. I mean, they're, 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 they're nothing in compared to the height of the Sears Tower. I, I don't believe that in Genesis 11, God was worried about how high they built the building. You can go sit at the 95th floor and have food or the 96th floor and have a drink in the John Hancock building. Like, it, God's not worried about the height of the building. That's not what he's talking about. It's the root in your heart of pride that says, I will make my own way to heaven outside of God. I will do it inside of my own strength. That's the pride that I'm rooting out today. Now, I'm going to say something. It's going to be a very strong statement. 
So I'll, this is like, remember I said right before we started this, hang tight. Don't shut it off halfway through. We still got about another eight minutes to go. So don't, don't quit just yet. But let me say something. If you say, I did the same thing. If you say that I am going to focus on healing and power and miracles, financial provision, and I do not have to study that because I will never deny the Lord if that's what you say. Now, I hear that a lot in the church. I'm just going to focus on the power and the winning my neighbor to God and witnessing the gospel and it doesn't matter because I'm never going to deny God. I even said that for a long time. I said, I don't have to study that because I won't deny. The premise, remember, broad stroke overarching argument, single focus premise. There's a specific point I'm coming against today. When you say that, you are operating in the spirit of pride. You are self-exalting your own self. And you might say, well, what do you mean? You can't say I'm full of pride or full of the devil just because I say I'm not going to deny God. No, it's why you say it. That's the point I'm trying to emphasize today. Listen to this. The Bible is very clear that what you don't know will lead to your destruction. And what you willfully reject will lead to your destruction. That's Hosea. Jesus said, I'd have you not to be ignorant. Paul said, I'd have you not to be ignorant. Peter said, I'd have you not to be ignorant. Jesus said, I spoke it so you wouldn't be offended. So the Bible is very clear that you have to be people of understanding. Daniel eleven thirty three. 33, the people of understanding will instruct many. So over and over and over, the Bible says you need to learn it, you need to study it, and you need to have understanding. But for somebody to say, I don't have to study it, yet I still will remain faithful, is where you have put your own trust inside of your own self. That right there is self-exaltation. That right there is pride. And that's what I'm coming against. That right there is the spirit of the Tower of Babel. You're saying, I will get to heaven no matter what happens, whether I study it or I don't study it, whether I go through it or I don't go through it. Like, I want people to remain faithful until the end, but I want you to be a people of understanding that remain faithful, not to be people that are willfully ignorant, people that have chosen to say, well, it's in the word of God, but I don't do that, close the book and put it away. And there's a lot of people that do that. When we talk about end time prophecy, and I'm, if I say the harlot, abomination of desolation, judgments of God, I, I pronounce like a big topic out of the word of God that deals with the end times, and people will immediately say, well, I don't do that stuff, and I don't worry about it, and I don't have to worry about it because I'm getting to heaven anyway. That, whether I study it or not doesn't affect whether I'm going to heaven because I'm going to remain faithful no matter what because I will never deny the Lord and I will always... That's what's called self-exaltation. You have rooted yourself so deep in pride. There's a seed of pride in your heart that says, I do not have to do what God has told me to do, yet I still will get to heaven. That right there is a tear. It's the thing that's intoxicating and deadly that will grow up inside of you and lead to the destruction of your flesh. I'm trying to be uh, as, I'm trying not to be as direct as I possibly can when I give this lesson, but I really need you to hear me today because this is not of secondary importance. This is of a very primary importance because of this. I want to read one more thing. Go to Revelation chapter 17. Verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, what I want you to understand, and I just want to, this is the thought I want to propose to you. I'm going to propose an entire question to you today. So listen to me when I say this. John, who wrote the book of the Revelation, was the same John who wrote the Gospel of John. So he wrote the Gospel of John, 
wrote the book of the Revelation, wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Five books of the Bible did this man author. He wrote five books of the Bible. When he was in the Gospel of John, he called himself the one in which God loved. He called himself the disciple that Jesus loved. He is John the Beloved. That's what he called himself. So he had a deep revelation of how much God loved him. I want you to understand that. And I want to emphasize the fact that after he was endued with the power of the Holy Ghost, after he had pastored churches, and 70 years later, 50 years later, however long it was between Pentecost and him at the Isle of Patmos, in between those two things, however long that was, 40, 50 years, however long it was, when John saw Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, it says he fell down as a dead man. This man called himself the one in which God loved. He said that about himself. He's the one that authored the book, I Am the Beloved of God. And he sees Jesus in the glory and falls down as a dead man. Which means the comprehension of what he saw even when Jesus was walking on the earth was nothing compared to what he saw in glory. Well, he reads the whole, he, he authors the first 16 books of Revelation, which is the seals, the trumpets, the vile judgments. He sees all of the judgments of God against the earth. And then the angel says, come up here and I will show you the judgment of the great whore. Talking about the harlot Babylon. And when John goes up, he says, I wondered with admiration, great admiration, not just admiration, great admiration at the harlot. Now, you might say, why is that important? Because when the angel told him to come and see it, he said, this is the judgment of the great whore. Now, I want you to understand that because if you think that you never have to study it and you'll just somehow remain faithful until the end, you're self-exalting yourself. You're rooted in pride and you're full of the devil. And I want you to break free of that today by understanding that even John, the seduction and the deception will be so high. There is no option. You must study what the Bible says concerning the end times. We're out of time today, so I'll just have to pick this up again tomorrow. But Father, bless these people. In Jesus' name, I give you all the glory for it. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day. And we'll finish this tomorrow. Sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Because you take good care of me. The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take